Chapter 1 1 Timothy 28 Proper Prayer Posture Therefore I want men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger and disputing. Of all the activities in which Christians engage and which have become a part of their lives, perhaps none perplexes us and causes us so much trouble as prayer. This is true at all times, but it is especially true during difficult crises such as war. As was the case in World War I, it is clear that prayer is one of the most pressing issues in the current situation of World War I. In fact, people have been struggling with this issue for a long time, and we have been praying about it ever since the emergency broke out in September 1938. Many people have asked why God did not listen to our prayers and prevent the outbreak of World War II. So it is clear that the issue of prayer is one of the most important issues that should concern us. In times of trouble, people instinctively turn to God in prayer. In times of trouble, people instinctively turn to God because they realize that their fate and the fate of those they love are in the hands of someone stronger than themselves. People in such situations cling to God because they realize that events and circumstances that they normally believe they can control are now beyond their control. Even people who are normally self-reliant find themselves in desperate situations and feel compelled to think of God and pray. They cling to God only when they have a desperate need and ask Him to grant their requests, and they wait, trusting that God will answer their prayers. When they find themselves in difficult situations, they practice their faith even more intensely than ever before. Regardless of whether they are formally religious or not, or whether they expect or don't expect anything from religion, they believe in God and expect God to do great things, and they don't think there's anything they shouldn't pray for. That's why people talk so much about prayer in times of danger, and why so much is written about prayer in times of crisis. That alone should be reason enough for us to consider prayer. But there are two other very real reasons why we shouldn't avoid addressing the issue of prayer. I don't think there is any other aspect of our faith that is so sloppily thought about, written about, and spoken about as prayer. And I think that's because those who have dealt with the issue of prayer have dealt with it in the way I just pointed out. People who normally don't give much thought or study to the nature of prayer, when they are in trouble, they turn to prayer. And there are also those who cling to prayer solely because they have been missled by someone who teaches them that all they have to do is pray and everything will work out. But they put such high hopes and expectations on prayer that they don't even think about the realities of the situation that they need to examine and they end up getting screwed. God does not always answer prayers in the way the supplicant hopes in fact. The opposite may happen the supplicant. Not only doubts and panics, but also openly criticizes God and finally abandons faith. In fact, many people abandoned faith at the outbreak of World War I. At that time, people prayed to God for various special problems, such as asking God to bring their sons home safely. However, God did not fulfill their requests as they expected. In the end, they abandoned their faith and left Christianity, dissatisfied with God. As pastors, we've all had to deal with questions about the nature of prayer and, most importantly, issues raised by people who are discouraged by unanswered prayers. Of course, there are other common issues raised by disasters such as war. But the issue of prayer is more important than any of these because it is often the main cause of many other problems. While we are still in the beginning stages of the war, we have some time to think about prayer and prepare our hearts and minds. We don't have time for that after our hearts have been broken. Before we get into the specifics of prayer, let's take a look at some of the common misconceptions people have about prayer. One of the biggest causes of discouragement for prayers is that too often we think of prayer only in terms of what we need to get answered. When we think of it this way, prayer becomes a device designed to produce a certain result. We believe that when we need something, all we have to do is pray to God for it, and He will give it to us. We think we need to cling to God at all costs, and we believe we have the right to do so. 
but we don't even think about giving Him praise and worship. We don't consider our own circumstances or think that God is the one who dwells on high and forever and ever. Nor do we consider that because we have sinned. Even our goodness and righteousness are filthy rags in God's eyes. Nor do we consider that we need to listen to God or wait for God to dwell among us. To them, God is just an object to be tied to when we need Him and to be attended to when we need Him. Let's compare our prayers with those of Moses, Daniel, Isaiah, and the Apostle Paul, as recorded in the Bible, and let's take a good look at the order of petitions in the Lord's Prayer that He taught His disciples. Isn't it obvious that we ask God only to satisfy our own selfish desires, leaving out the most important and basic things? Of course. Many people neglect their prayer life during normal times, but when they are in trouble, they often cling to God in prayer because they are trying to satisfy their own selfish desires. The second reason why prayers become discouraged is that we are overly preoccupied with what God will do. As we have seen, we are not thinking about the nature of God, who we need to get close to. Furthermore, we often have presumptuous ideas about what God should do first. Even though we should be pondering the nature of God and His infinite wisdom, we have the arrogant idea that if we think something is right, it must be right, and therefore God must listen to it. How sad it is that we never try to know what God's will is in any matter. Do we keep our minds open to different possibilities and try to find out what God's will is in a given situation? Do we seek to know God's will through prayer instead of asking God to do His will? or clinging to Him and saying, O Lord, though your ways may be dark, make your paths straight and not mine. We demand that God do our will and fulfill our desires. Also, instead of humbly entrusting ourselves to God and asking Him to reveal His will to us, we often command God or tell God what to do. That's why we get angry with God and even doubt His goodness when our desires are not met. We have this mindset not only when we pray for personal problems, but also when we pray for our nation and even the world at large. A third reason prayers suffer is that we tend to read what the Bible or church documents say about answered prayers and generalize. We focus our attention on one aspect of a problem, completely ignoring the other important aspects, and then wonder why our prayers have not been answered. We know that God answered the prayers of George Muller and other saints of Christianity, but we think that all they had to do was make their needs known to God. They prayed and made their needs known to God, and God answered them. We think that God is always ready to hear our prayers, and we think that God is always ready to hear our prayers. So we jump to the conclusion that we need to do nothing, more than make our needs known to God by praying. Then, when we don't get the answer we expect, we get worried, angry, and quickly begin to doubt God. Of course, the blame lies entirely with ourselves for not seeing the situation for what it is, because we fail to consider how different Muir's lifestyle was from ours. He saw himself as a man called by God to be a minister of prayer and faith, and he saw it as his mission to reveal God's grace and glory in a particular way that was befitting of him. And yet we tend to ignore this entirely. For Muller, receiving God's answer was secondary. His primary concern was always to reveal God's glory, and we fail to realize this. In fact, no one who has the slightest idea that Muller went through many trials and tempered himself through rigorous discipline would complain to God. Not only Muller, but all the other people who have had their prayers answered have likewise gone through trials and tempered themselves through rigorous discipline. We want all the blessings that saints have received, but we forget that they were saints. We shouldn't ask God why he answers the prayers of someone like Muller, but not mine, but rather why can't I live a life like Muller's? Of course, as I hinted at earlier, he was a man specifically called to fulfill the ministry of intercession. The Apostle Paul speaks of the gift of faith, among the many gifts imparted by the Holy Spirit. Isn't this faith specifically expressed through the mediating act of prayer? Once we know the above facts, we should realize how outrageous our demands have been. 
Another problem that needs to be addressed with regard to prayer is our inability to distinguish between genuine answers to prayer and circumstances that appear to be answers to prayer. This is a very difficult subject that we must treat with great care. The reason why this issue is so important is that pious, people of faith and those who strive to demonstrate to others, the miracles of God's grace often fall into this error. It is no wonder that they fall into this error. They want to demonstrate to others that God is directly involved in human affairs, and they want to give them tangible signs that God loves them. They are so intent on finding these examples that it is. No wonder they cannot distinguish between genuine and false responses. But the teachings of the New Testament exhort us to witness to God's love. The New Testament tells us to bear witness in all things and to hold fast to what is good. The New Testament also tells us that there are evil forces at work in the world that skillfully imitate the works of God and deceive the elect. We must scrutinize signs and wonders to ensure that our zeal does not lead us to mistake. The work of Satan for the work of God. Now let's address the issue in more practical terms. Do we not confuse chance occurrences with answers to prayer? First, there are times when we mistake strange phenomena, such as telepathy or emotional transference for answers to prayer. Unfortunately, this field is still in an unexplored stage. Some people claim that through prayer, God even transmits one person's thoughts to another, whether they are right or wrong. That is not the kind of answer to prayer the Bible speaks of. Nor can such a claim be taken as an indication that God not only directs us in the direction of action, but also that God acts directly. Second, psychological phenomena, or psychics, are sometimes mistaken for answers to prayer. While it would be futile to deny any phenomenon that is proven to be real, we must be able to distinguish between manifestations of evil spirits and the merciful activity of the Holy Spirit by penetrating the nature of the medium that produces these phenomena. I do not equate the power of suggestive abilities and medical diagnoses that have been rated as accurate in healing case reports as answers to prayer. This topic is very complex and esoteric, and many people think that I am only raising these questions because I have no faith. But in light of the New Testament teaching, these questions are very important. The exorcists and black magicians of Judaism were also capable of strange things. Jans and Jambers could give Moses a run for his money. Nothing dishonors the gospel more than outrageous claims, natural explanations or otherwise. And nothing dishonors the gospel more than horse claims. I can confidently say that we should only expect direct intervention from God for things that cannot be explained by other hypotheses. Failure to do so leads to outrageous thinking and ultimately to disappointment. These four points are the common causes of our misunderstanding of prayer and our struggles with it. We have discussed these causes at length based on the principle that more than half of suffering is healed by exposing its true nature. But in the course of our consideration of the causes of suffering, we have discovered one great principle, and that is that in the whole subject of prayer, there is no question so important as the question of the right posture of prayer. It is because our posture is wrong that we often make mistakes, and we attribute all our faults to God. But the suffering we actually experience is caused by our failure to look at ourselves. If we would just look at ourselves, about half of the questions we ask would resolve themselves, and even if they don't, we'd be able to solve them in our own strength. Now let's cut to the chase and address the question of proper prayer posture. This matter is of such important sin. Today's circumstances that we cannot afford not to study it carefully, and to look carefully at the teachings on the matter, if we know how to pray, or in other words, how to deal with the problem of prayer, the question of what kind of prayer God wants will solve itself, and the complexities of answering prayer will be easily resolved. The question of what kind of prayer I should offer to God depends entirely on how I approach God, examining who I am and what I have done before I pray to God, is far more important than the actual act of praying. We shouldn't just be concerned with getting the answers we want from prayer. 
But we should first examine ourselves and see if we are worthy of prayer. How should we pray, and are we worthy of prayer? To this question, the Apostle Paul answers, Therefore I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger and strife or doubt. In this answer, we find several conditions that define the act of prayer. Let's briefly consider these conditions. The first condition is that we must lift up holy hands. We are not dealing here with the gestures of prayer, nor are we saying that Jews generally stood up and lifted their hands to God in prayer. We need not get bogged down in the fact that it was Jewish custom to wash our hands before worship. The holy hands were merely a formal symbol used by the Apostle Paul to indicate a principle he wanted to emphasize. Clean hands, or holy hands, represent a holy character. Anyone who wants to draw near to God in any way must be of a holy character. No one who is not holy will see God. God is pure in heart and cannot look upon wickedness, nor can he abide rebellion. Nothing is more contrary to the teaching of the entire Bible than the idea that anyone, at any time, in any situation, can approach God by simply praying. In fact, the first consequence of sin, the primary result of the fall, is the breaking of fellowship between God and man. By sinning, man forfeited his right to approach God and could never again approach God. However, God, who is infinite in grace, has opened up a way for man to draw near to himself. Once you realize this fact, the meaning of the Old Testament teachings on sacrifice, the tabernacle, the temple rituals and Aaron's priesthood will make perfect sense. In other words, at that time, there was no other way for man to approach God other than through these things. Only in this way could men at that time enter into communion with God, according to God's instructions. However, our Holy Lord surpasses everything in the Old Testament. The total meaning of the events of the Lord's coming into this world, living among men, dying, resurrection and ascension is that through these things that he went through, a new way of living has been opened for us to meet with God. The Lord says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Therefore, the first thing we need to consider when we seek to meet with God in prayer is our own sin. The first question we must ask is, how can I approach God? As soon as we ask these questions, we hear the answer. We have access to God because the blood of Jesus Christ atones for our sins and cleanses us. But that doesn't mean that if we believe in Christ alone, we can have access to God no matter how we live. We are still sinners and we are still sinning. So we need to repent of our sins and ask God to forgive us for sinning again. Repentance in this case doesn't just mean mourning over sin or feeling remorseful. Repentance means godly sorrow, which includes hating sin, forsaking sin, and deciding to live a holy life. In other words, recognizing this need to put away sin and deciding to sanctify our hands is a necessary condition for coming to God. Therefore, we must do this before. We can even question the answer to our prayers. You remember when the psalmist said, if I harbor iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. He meant that if he himself harbored sin in his heart and did not deal with it, he could not expect God to listen to his prayers. But if we condemn our sin, the one who searches the hearts of men and tests the spirits will surely listen to our prayers. Let me give you another example. Do you remember the significant words of God in Jeremiah 151? where Jeremiah prayed for his people, and God said to him, Although Moses and Samuel stood before me, my heart is not toward this people, so drive them out from before me. So why Moses and Samuel? Because they were holy men. In this passage, God seems to be saying to Jeremiah, Even if the greatest men of the past intercede on behalf of this people, I cannot grant their requests. A similar statement is found in Ezekiel 14.14. 14. Noah, Daniel, Job, and these three men will be there. But they will save their own lives by their own righteousness. For I, the Lord God, have spoken. Which means exactly the same thing as the above verse. The report of the healing of the blind man in John 9. 
is a great example of the same thing. The Pharisees tested and interrogated the healed man, trying to convince him that Jesus was a sinner and therefore could not heal him. The healed man replied, I know that God does not hear sinners, but hears those who are godly and walk according to his will. These examples emphasize the fact that we must have holy hands if we expect our prayers to be answered. Now consider the famous words from the book of James. The prayer of a righteous man has much power. Spiritual fervor and earnest desire are not enough. Only the righteous can expect to see the results they desire. God's promises are never unconditional. He has not promised to grant our every request unconditionally. The first condition God lays down is to lift up holy hands. Only when we choose to live according to his example, to live, according to his holy will, will we be qualified to pray to God. And our prayers will reach the very throne of God. Will you then doubt God and complain to him that he does not answer your prayers? The second condition is without wrath. First, we need to know the exact meaning of the word wrath. This word should not be used in a general sense. It does not mean an expression of anger or rage, but rather a character that is incapable of loving others. Therefore, it does not mean a sudden outburst of anger, but rather a state of harboring malice and resentment. It emphasizes not the way we approach God, but the way we approach our fellow man, our neighbor. Moreover, it addresses the whole of man's soul, meaning that it addresses not only his behavior, but also his outlook or attitude toward life with others. How important this is then, and how sad it would be if we were to fall into a state of wrath. This heart can also be seen in our attitudes toward our neighbors. In this case, wrath would mean unforgiveness of resentment, jealousy, malice, or any wrong that our neighbor has actually done or is perceived to have done to us. Yet we can be so unforgiving of others' wrongs, yet expect God to forgive our sins and grant us what we want if we just pray. In the light of the teachings of the New Testament, this attitude of ours is wrong. You remember the words of our Lord in the Sermon on the Mount, therefore, if you bring your offering to the altar, and there you remember that you have something against your brother, leave your offering before the altar, and go first and be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your offering. And the Lord's Prayer teaches us to pray, Forgive us our trespasses, just as we forgive those who trespass against us. And there is even a parable in Matthew's Gospel that relates to this, in which our Lord describes an evil servant who forgives himself, but does not forgive those who are indebted to him, and then sums up his teaching with the words, If you do not forgive your brothers, each one in his own right, so will my heavenly Father do to you. This is a wonderful idea, but it seems to be saying that those who complain about God and the world at large because things don't go their way or because God doesn't seem to answer their prayers are, in effect, not worthy of God's prayers. They don't even think favorably of God for not answering their prayers. What a frightening and insulting thought! But rather they take the initiative to complain to God. Therefore, we must not be angry. The idea that we have a right to expect God to listen to our prayers and petitions is described in perfect detail in 2 Corinthians 13. If we are servants, we must not have feelings of anger toward kings and all who are in authority, and we must not hate our enemies. The law says, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who insult you. So we must not be wrathful. The third condition is without doubt, or more precisely, without dispute. The word dispute does not refer to quarrels with others, but rather to quarrels with oneself. So it implies a state of agitation, even intellectual denial. This doubt will be expressed in many ways. It may be a doubt about the nature of God, or it may be a doubt about the fact that God exists, as the writer of Hebrews puts it. Some people try to get their prayers answered without addressing these basic and important perquisites, while others, having clearly addressed these perquisites, doubt God's mercy and the fact that God is willing to hear our prayers. We'll discuss this issue in more detail in the next section, but for now, let's just make it clear that prayer in such a state is futile. 
There are also those who doubt the power or possibility of prayer what will happen if we pray, or what good will come of our prayers. If we harbor these doubts in our hearts, we may try to pray to God. But we are in this state, and yet we cannot help, but be in desperate need of God's help whenever we find ourselves in a difficult situation. We do not know what to do or where to turn, and whenever we do, we remember that we once heard about someone who prayed to God and received a mysterious answer, and we decide to pray to God to see if it will happen to us. We cry out in the dark without thinking the matter through, or keeping in mind all the conditions mentioned above, thinking that maybe God will listen and answer our prayer. People often pray to God in disbelief and doubt, and then, when God does not answer them or fulfill their wishes, they complain and become angry with God, concluding that religion is useless. But if we do not fulfill this third condition, our prayers are useless. We must approach God believing that God exists and is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Prayer is not a tool to test God. Prayer is not a tool to test God, but rather an expression and result of our faith in God and our readiness to leave everything to God and His holy will. It is an act of blasphemy against God to pray to God to see if a prayer will work, and it is of no use to try God in that way. Only those who know God, who sincerely believe in God, and who are ready to say, Thy will be done, with the conviction that all this is the purpose of God's holiness and love, at any time and in any circumstance, have their prayers answered. There should be no doubt or dispute in the prayers and the prayers should not have the mind to try God. Rather, they should be unhurried and quiet, leaving everything to God and His perfect will. These three items are the conditions that govern our prayer behavior. As you ponder these conditions, shouldn't you be surprised that God sometimes doesn't give us the answers we want to our prayers, but rather surprised at our unilateral attitude that He should listen to our prayers and grant our every request. Then let's put these principles into practice while there is still time. Dangerous things can happen at any time, and whenever they do, we feel the need to pray. Let us wash our hands, purify our hearts, and strengthen our faith, so that no matter how difficult the situation, instead of testing God with doubts in our hearts, we can cling to Him, saying with the Apostle Paul, I know Him whom I have entrusted, and I am persuaded that He is able to keep that which I have committed unto him until that day. God may not always give us the answers we want to our prayers, but we will eventually realize that he has given us what is best for us. So let us be concerned with the glory of God, rather than with satisfying our own desires.